Welcome to the Aviation Insurance Podcast, the podcast that helps aircraft owners and aviation businesses learn and understand the complex world of aviation insurance and risk management. From the basic principles of aviation insurance to risk management techniques and updates on the aviation insurance market, the Aviation Insurance Podcast is your guide to traverse the world of aviation insurance. Now, here's your host, Tim Bonnell. Well, welcome to the Aviation Insurance Podcast. And today I'm excited to be on location as it may be. Uh, So you're seeing a different background than normal. And uh, today, a lot of uh, aviation insurance professionals and risk, aviation risk managers are in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, for the Aviation Insurance Association annual conference. And uh, so we wanted to take advantage of that opportunity to visit with some uh, people that we've been wanting to uh, to let you hear their story and to, to hear what they're doing because it's pretty exciting. And so uh, today I'm excited to have uh, Alistair Blundy here uh, from across the pond for those of us uh, in the U.S., Alistair is the CEO of SkyRisks, the pioneer of aircraft insurance and risk management solutions in the fast-growing advanced air mobility sector. Along with a team of insurance and data science veterans, uh, he co-founded SkyRisks in 2023 to be the global leader in insurance for revolutionary aircraft, such as the new breed of eVTOLs, the electronic vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, and a broad array of innovative technologies across both piloted and autonomous flights. So Alistair leads uh, with an underwriting first approach at sky risks uh, driven by a deep awareness of the complex engineering and regulatory challenges faced by the industry which is new uh, and drawing plenty of issues so it's good it's focus on a superior product uh, expertise and developing granular pricing models built on market leading data aggregation analysis and that's part of why we've asked you to be here today uh, participating in a panel on what ensuring these type of aircraft and vehicles looks like and so alistair thank you uh, for being here and for joining us today. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Tim. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we talked about being a pioneer and and just briefly, you're not new to aviation insurance, right? So talk about kind of how you, uh, you know, just made that transition from, you know, traditional aviation insurance underwriting into these emerging technologies. Sure, I was underwriting aerospace business at Allianz and I'm the big global carrier, great team, fantastic company, loved it. Started to see aviation changing a little bit. And we know that over the last 200 years, the world looks very, very different how it did. And in large part, I think it's probably due to the, the silicon chip. The silicon chip has changed everything fairly quickly. Uh, but aerospace always sort of falls behind other, other sectors, as we know. And so only in the last couple of decades, the silicon chip has really started changing aviation in terms of the way that aircraft fly differently. It's not only the silicon chip. There's other technologies that come around that. And so then, of course, when the world starts changing, the things in underwriters' inboxes on their email is different. And so we start seeing these risks that don't quite fit the the conventional profile of risks that we had. So if if you look on a computer of an insurance broker or an insurance underwriter, they'll have a different folder for each class of business. You know, how they segment the risk, they might have an airline folder and a general aviation, then aerospace and maybe space, products liability, premises liability, whatever it is. If you receive an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in your inbox that maybe doesn't even have a pilot and is autonomously flown from the ground and has passengers on board potentially. What folder do you put that in? That's the sort of position we're out of the aviation market and insurance. It's a great time to be in aviation because there's so much happening, Um, but insuring it does require, I believe, and we believe at SkyRisk, a specialist approach so that we can understand this technology so that we can confidently deploy capacity and help these aircraft fly because you can't fly without insurance. So uh, I was underwriting very happily at Allianz, started to notice this, and along with a small team, founded Sky Risks early 2023, and went and secured uh, A-rated insurance capacity from Convex Group in London for a great partner for us in this space. They're really committed to data-driven underwriting as we underwrite emerging risks. So we certainly have that philosophy as well. We'll be completely data-driven in how we deploy capacity. I'm sure we'll talk about that later because it's a word that people often say in aviation insurance, and there are different opinions on how you actually make it happen. So we founded the company last year, secured insurance capacity, opened the doors to brokers, traditional distribution model, writing business to aviation brokers in London with a global scope, and we're open for business. Yeah, and and just through this process, you're attending multiple conferences and kind of becoming not just an insurance, but a subject matter expert as well, which is why we're glad to have you here today. So. 
you know, a lot of people are not even used to this term yet. You know, a lot of terms, you're, you're just saying AAM and EVTOL. What does that mean? So we've got advanced air mobility aircraft, electronic vertical takeoff and landing. What does that mean? So they're a hot topic at the moment. And in the last few years, there's been hundreds of startups. You know, it's, it's this race that a lot of people, a lot of visionaries see possibilities. And uh, so you see people trying, failing, succeeding. Uh, but in, in the, as far as the insurance goes, you know, you're one of the pioneers in this, along with just a few other insurance companies. So uh, you've set up SkyRisk to address these issues. What about, you know, these urban air mobility companies that are coming? That, you know, they're making big promises about, you know, how they're going to revolutionize trans transportation, you know, private, even, you know, uh, we would call charter type operations today, as you alluded to, that, you know, carrying up passengers. Um, how does, you know, you talk about data driven underwriting and, you know, how do we evaluate these risks? I mean, I think that's just the big question to start with is, is how do we make all this information um, practical and, you know, something that can be underwritten uh, when, you know, it's in its infancy, you don't know what it looks like. What does that process look like? And, and, and what are the things that needs to happen, you know, from the aviation underwriting perspective to begin to address them? That's true. So a recent poll in North America found that 75% of Americans don't know what an EV toll is. So we got to start there by addressing that. Yep. That's saying, actually, we don't know really at large in society what this technology is yet. And I guess many of the listeners to your podcast might be listening to this now being, what are these two people talking about? Right. <laughs> what's UAM? Yeah. And of course, we love an acronym. So the space has come with its own new set of acronyms, which no yeah. needs. And there we are. <laughs> we have to deal with them. So AAM, Advanced Air Mobility. RAM, Regional Air Mobility. UAM, Urban Air Mobility. The least helpful thing you can do is Google it. Because if you Google it and click on images, what you'll find is a load of AI generated artwork yes. with completely unrealistic airframe designs. You look at it closely, you think that's like, that thing's lopsided. It's got a different size rotors on each side. It doesn't quite work, but they're flying on top of buildings. They're taking people around. The AI art might have a cityscape with 30 different aircraft of different sizes flying between different buildings and different hubs and maybe the national airport to the tile. That's what happens if you Google it. So a lot of people react to the advanced air mobility movement with skepticism, but it's, that's been their exposure to it. Right. They think this just isn't realistic. Yeah. How is this going to happen? And so the, um, the insurance underwriter's response can be the same. It's exactly. like, well, maybe we'll just react when we actually have physical aircraft in the world and we're not just talking about fancy slide decks anymore, but we're talking about real aircraft, real exposure that we can then price and deal with. But I think actually... We at Skyrise, when we started, the approach to underwriting advanced air mobility, I know it was in the bio, and it's the, it's the heart of the company, is to understand the engineering challenges and the regulatory challenges. The reason why we singled those two things out is I think, not just in underwriting, but in broking, on the legal side, the loss adjusting side, I'm sure, certainly with the NTSB and the AIB, the, the crash investigators, the more deep your understanding of the actual technology, how it works, how it flies, what is in an EV toll? What is an EV toll? How does a battery system work? All of this detail, the better we understand that, the better we can underwrite it. Not only have, the better we can underwrite it, but the better we can structure a pricing approach to the whole industry as it segments out into the urban piece and the metropolitan piece and the more regional piece, and in time, maybe longer distances. So that's the approach. That more the engineering side, understanding the regulatory side helps. And I think I've heard you say this on your podcast before, and it's a great point, but where the regulators don't regulate something because it's not in their scope, but it does have an implication on safety, it's often down to the insurance market to regulate that. So when I used to write airport business, often there'd be um, a condition and a policy that's something like no operation of vehicles within X meters of aircraft. That's still a regulation. That's the insurers stepping in and saying, actually, we're going to drive safety. Right. So as we start to deploy capacity on new risks in aviation in the advanced air mobility space, that's going to be really helpful. And that's going to help drive safety in the industry. So it's not just the underwriting and the pricing. It's also helping the industry to grow. Absolutely. And it is. It's interesting. That, I mean, the point is a lot of people say, well, the FAA or the, you know, the European equivalent will allow me to do this. And that's the point is, well, they're also not going to be paying, you know, several hundred thousand dollars or several million dollars or more if there's a loss. And so it's really... There's two, you know, there's the official government regulatory body of, of operating aircraft. And then there's the, the insurance who, as a result of wanting to avoid paying massive, you know, losses and damages, and obviously, you know, preventing loss of property and life, uh, step in and play a bit, pivotal role. And so, yeah, you're, 
you know, I hadn't even really thought about that in this space is as it's at its infancy, um, you know, obviously insurers will play, you know, a very big role in helping it to be, um, you know, a market that's as safe as it can be uh, while still providing solutions to, you know, ensure these uh, vehicles, which, um, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, the aviation industry has always done. Okay. You know, we're, we're going to space. How are we going to ensure that? Well, let's, let's pool different people who think we can ensure this. And now we're going from small airplanes to, to, to commercial airlines and jumbo jets. And, and so, uh, and then we got into the UAS space. And so it's, it's always exciting to see when, uh, aviation insurers take that, um, innovation and trying to make it work. And, and part of what's interesting is, you know, there's a lot more data points available when operations really are going with um, these aircraft. Uh, and, and we get into this a little bit with especially airlines and corporate aircraft with flight data recording and stuff. But, you know, there, there's new inputs with more data with how these uh, aircraft operate. And, and you're learning all kinds of things. And we could probably go on for about an hour because I think you're becoming a subject matter on the battery uh, powered systems. But there's also these telematic, you know, the data points like you're trying to get on the engineering is what you're saying. And so I sense that this is part of that. Can you just like touch on without losing uh, me in the process? Like, <laughs> yeah, the battery that's just from a high level perspective, what that's looking like as you're evaluating risks in this space and determining the best way to move forward on a broad level. Yeah, yeah. T two things that people said to me recently, a battery manufacturer said to me, you've got to think of these things as flying batteries. Yeah. And uh, at a different conference, it was an aviation conference, Somebody said to me, oh, so you're underwriting this. Uh, you're going to be a battery underwriter. <laughs> you're not going to be an, a, a, an aviation underwriter for very, yeah. for very long. You're yeah. going to be a battery underwriter. But the batteries are at the heart of this. Approximately 50% of the takeoff weight is the battery. Um, generally, they're distributed around the aircraft. Um, it's not like putting a battery in a remote control where you just slide a single battery in. Right. Um, there's something called an 18650, which is a cylindrical cell. Uh, I don't know if you have double A batteries here in the US. Oh, it's the same. Yep. It's the same. I should have known that. But they're slightly bigger, slightly taller, and, and wider than a than a double A. That's an 18650. That's the standard lithium cell, nominal voltage. I think about sort of four volts. That's what's in electric cars. They just join them all together, thousands of those, wow. and that forms a battery pack. And then you have a battery management system, another one of our acronyms, the BMS, that goes around the battery. And that helps to tell us exactly how the battery is performing, which is really important. One of the causes of issues in the drone space at the moment is that small drone batteries are sometimes hobby grade. They don't have a BMS. We don't know what the temperature in the cell is. We don't know what the resistance is or the voltage. We, we normally know the voltage, actually, but we, we don't know all these parameters about the battery. When it comes to aerospace, we're flying people across the sky. We've got to know those things. So that's how we're approaching sort of the, the battery aspect of this. I guess we haven't defined advanced endability in this podcast. Maybe sure. just have a go at that. Yes, please. I, I'd be, I've read all, all the different definitions. Yes. And some people just go straight to UAM. It's the urban thing. It's flying people around in their taxis in, in cities. That's what gets all the headlines. And then when you go to the ELSA's definition of the FAA and NASA, it tends to be, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say vague, but broad. Quite broad. So it is specific. It's it's new aviation technologies um, being used to move people and goods in a new way. It's sort of so it's necessarily broad because they need to encompass a lot. As I've been in the industry now for for at least twelve months, really meeting everyone I can, the common denominator is electric propulsion. That's really and so I include drones. I include the UAS space. It's a, using electric motors in an aviation context, and that doesn't mean you're necessarily battery powered. You could have an inboard hybrid turbine burning fossil fuel that's powering electric motors. It's just much more efficient than burning fossil fuel. So that's why you might want to do it that way. Fewer moving parts, simpler air frame, et cetera. And that's, so that's how I'm thinking about advanced mobility now. And I know that's not a great definition either. It's not even really a definition, but that's how I think about this space. Emerging aviation technology, the majority of the time is going to involve electrified propulsion systems. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of my vehicles happens to be a Tesla. So it's been very interesting, uh, you know, learning and seeing how that works and all the, all the data available, um, just driving that and how, you know, Patrick can be navigating, you know, when to charge, when not to charge. And, uh, not that they're not without issue, but it's pretty amazing technology. And, uh, it's really interesting to see, you know, get into the space of aviation, obviously, um, the battery sizes vary and different a little bit. And 
Um, those are unique challenges, but I've not really thought about you're going to be able to make sure you have flying batteries, so to speak. Right. I mean, it's worth mentioning 18650s, those cylindrical hard ones, aren't going to be used in most of the EV tolls. Yeah. They're going to use lithium pouch cells, yeah. which are sort of rectangular aluminium. They can expand and contract, which presents a, a little bit of a risk there. Yeah. You asked about telematics. Yeah. It's, you, can, you can tell where this is going with really complicated aircraft that are collecting gigabytes of data from every corner of the aircraft, every flight. So even the early the early VTOL manufacturers now with just hundreds of hours, some of them under their belt, have terabytes of data on hard drives. That's how much data we're getting from these aircraft. It's going to be very useful on the insurance piece, particularly in the case of a loss. What exactly happened? It's not going to take long to find out if we've got all that telemetry data. So trying to use that in aviation, there's been mixed success over the last few years. Yeah. There's been big ambitions. I'm sure you know, you speak to a lot of people on the underwriting side. Everybody wants to make telematics work in the aviation context. I think the key in our approach is to keep things really simple and incrementally make it more sophisticated. So we're, we're, we are entering the telematics piece. We're, we're starting with a very simplified approach that we know we can make work on a small number of metrics that we think are going to be really relevant rather than trying to ingest terabytes of data for each aircraft for each flight, which I, I, I'm not sure how workable that is. No, that's a great point. And, and you know, I think that you know, a lot of um, aviation insurers have been doing this a long time and, and trying to wrap their mind around what does integrating telematics look like and, and do we have reliable data and things like that. And, and I talk about this frequently. You know, we, we see something so big, we don't know what to do with it, so we just don't. And to your point, you know, I equate it to, you know, okay, you've got, you know, someone telling me I've got to go eat this elephant. And so I look at it, I can't do anything unless I just take that one or two bite. Like, what's that first bite and what's the next one? Do you go from there? And I think that's, that's such a great point is let's find what, what can we identify right now is the top one to have three, four, five key data points. And we can start there and see how we can use it because it's going to take um, new expertise. We're going to have to develop new capacities as an industry. Uh, in order to address this. And at the end of the day, the goal is is safety, fewer losses. You know, I visit with, you know, underwriting companies, even on this podcast, they talk about the cost of claims, you know, they've got to go down fewer losses. And, and you know, this doesn't happen overnight, but it takes people innovating. And so that's why I'm excited to have you here. That's why I told everyone I was excited to bring you on. We've got a session tomorrow uh, for our continuing insurance uh, education sessions that you are a big part of with talking about these uh, advanced air mobility aircraft and, and data-driven underwriting. And so uh, our audience will have, that have been here, we'll hear that uh, beforehand, but um, it's a, it's an exciting and emerging uh, issue that uh, it's exciting to, to visit with about you because that's really what, that's your wheelhouse and that's where you're at and, and you're one of very few that, that are doing that. So I know I didn't bring you here just to pat you on the back, but it's, we're, in this, it. we're, in, this, oh, well, good. we're in this pivotal state in aviation insurance, in aviation, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're going to the future. And so it's exciting to have these conversations and then to position ourselves as an industry uh, to ensure these risks properly while all at the same time improving safety, which benefits everyone involved. So, um, you know, we've kind of been talking about the batteries and stuff, and, and this may have come up in some of your previous answers, but what are the challenges and opportunities uh, advanced air mobility is bringing to the insurance market itself? There are very few things when it comes down to it that an aviation underwriter uses to price of risk and under those four or five buckets there are maybe lots of different questions they would ask but sure the key metric the key parameters that underwriters look at are actually not that not that many in number and i think that all of them are very different when it comes to electrified propulsion or autonomous flight systems so when we just look at the the airframe itself so the underwriter wants to know about the aircraft these aircraft uh, there's no the, the, the second hand value, the resale value, the salvage value is, is completely unknown. Right. All we have to go on is the sale price that the OEMs are telling us they're going to be and that they've agreed with the airlines and NLIs. They're completely emission cases because we have distributed electric propulsion. And so because you don't have to stick a turbo shaft engine on a particular configuration on the aircraft, one on each wing, for example, you can put them wherever best suits your mission. So the eVTOL companies are so innovative because they think, here's our, here's our mission. Here's what we want the aircraft to do. Hire some smart engineers, build an aircraft to do that. So the aircraft look completely different based on the use case. What does that mean for the insurance as we, as we try and look at the aircraft? The pilots, 
So gone are the days where you pull a yoke and a physical cable is attached to an elevator. It's just not how you fly either. I've flown a simulator um, for one of the EV tolls and you got them a, a couple of sticks and one of them was sort of controlling the transition of the aircraft so to take off vertically and, and then fly forward. And, and the other one was, uh, was controlling the other flight characteristics, but I wasn't manually controlling the, 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 the vector thrust units. It was doing it itself. It was figuring it out itself. So that's how drones fly. You know, if you ever sort of flown one of the small ones, if you take your hands off the controller and it sits there in the air, it yep. doesn't fall. Yep. So we're dealing with that. So then underwriters will ask, how many hours have you got? Do we ask that question anymore? I think we need a new approach. Yep. Um, my approach is to go to the OEMs and say, you know, you're running the training programs along with the FAA. How have you decided when a pilot's going to be ready? They can tell us that. And then right. we adopt that as the initial approach in, in the insurance market. Of course, the, the risk of thermal runaway and battery fires is the thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Not only how we might be able to prevent it, but when it happens, what does the aerodrome do to response? Yeah. Uh, what's the difference in that scenario between a licensed aerodrome and an unlicensed aerodrome? They're going to have different infrastructure, different regulations around them. If they're both accepting electric aircraft, this could be, this could be a big issue. Um, the pilots, airframes, there's the technology piece, software. The software caused it to crash. Who wrote the code? Oh, AI helped write the code. The software developer that told us that. Yeah. That was one for the lawyers to figure out. I right. I'm not really going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. And then infrastructure. We've got, we've got brand new infrastructure that needs to be built. Charging aircraft consumes a lot of energy. And we're going to have members of the public walking up to airframes that they are not familiar with, maybe on premises that they aren't, they aren't familiar with, and we know in the US that the social inflation and the claims inflation, that could be intensified when it comes to flying on electric aircraft, particularly if everything is everyone is filming everything and putting it on TikTok, which is right. what they're going to do because it's, yeah. it's going to be cool to fly on an EV toll. You're going to go to Dubai, you're going to get on your EV toll, fly to your hotel. Everybody's going to want to film it. Yep, absolutely. Well, you know, anytime there's new uh, technologies, new innovations, new sectors in the market, there's naysayers, you know. What about this? This can't be done. How are you going to address this? And as you were talking about this, you know, the battery thing, I think, is a bit point. But when just really going back to the UAS, there's two concerns that still occasionally get brought up. But, you know, one is that spoofing or the, the electronic hijacking. And the other being uh, the uh, there's not a shared fate on the unmanned side of it, you know, with the pilot and the aircraft. Have you, you know, how do you evaluate, evaluate that? And, 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 you know, is that kind of been a part of your thinking process? Well, as an underwriter, it makes a huge difference whether the aircraft has an airworthiness certificate, whether it has a type certificate. Right. And EV tolls carrying passengers, we're going to have a type certificate. So we can start by reading the airworthiness criteria, which are made public, which is great by the FAA. So there's stuff online that you can read now. It's a long document, but you can read through it and you can see exactly what the FAA is thinking in terms of making these aircraft as safe as possible. Same safety standards apply as apply to commercial airliners. 10 to the minus nine is the failure rate that is maximally acceptable for the regulators. When it comes to the UAS, you, you don't have to have that type right. certified. So as an underwriter, I think you just have to have a deeper understanding, particularly when it comes to low production volume equipment or bespoke equipment of who's made it, what modifications does it have, payloads of carrying, how it flies. Some of them now have, or quite a few have, have um, hybrid systems. So you put gasoline in and it has a range extender. It's a little two stroke or four stroke engine. Right. It's normally fuel injected rather than carburetor, but you've got in increased complexity in the UAS space that's not regulated. The FAA is not going to tell you how to make a two stroke engine safe in a hybrid system on a UAS. Yeah. So that's for the underwriters to figure out. Yeah. I had, and a lot of these concerns just haven't been major risks uh, in general. And, and we've had aircraft that, and pilots that do take a shared fate on purpose. So, it doesn't eliminate it. And, and uh, I think your point is good. And, you know, one of those concerns on the UAS space is just, you know, creating traffic with manned aircraft. And that's to your point, you know, when you get into the, you know, the certifications and things that those issues are addressed um, by the FAA and the other, other regulating bodies. So, you know, just like anything with any good thing, there's obstacles. And so you have to say, what are the opportunities in that? And how can we identify and mitigate those risks and you know and that's exactly what you're doing the deeper issue behind shared fate is that we're assuming that with it, when you're flying a uas there might be certain circumstances that would cause you to consider compromising the aircraft yeah. 
and putting it down. That's not going to happen when you've got pilots on board or where you've got passengers on board, even if it's being autonomous. Like, you need to get those people safely to the ground. Yeah. So all the redundancy systems are being built. That is absolute minimum that you have redundant cabling for each motor on your eVTOL and each battery has redundant cabling so you can lose battery packs and you can still fly. That's all being thought about in the eVTOL space. Yeah, I mean, and, and to to the point in the UAS space that's been thought about by the, the bigger, you know, certified or, um, you know, general manufacturers, like you said, if something goes wrong, it just sits there. <laughs> yeah, and it can, it can sit here, you know, straight and level and, and prevent, you know, a tumbling spiral when, when there's confusion. So it's it's definitely interesting. And, and obviously, you know, there's just a lot of money, a lot of investment going into it. So the opportunities really are, are unlimited uh, for the future of insuring these vehicles. And and uh, one of our, uh, one of the head uh, under, underwriters and uh, one of the heads of one of our insurers, you know, just kind of said he, he figures one of these days, the, you know, our companies will be kind of competing with the car insurance market because of the, you know, how the technologies and the interface will, you know, kind of merge over time. And that's, that's a, a very big picture view, but it was an interesting perspective. And I think one to, to keep in mind. So um, one of the things that I had wondered was what should advanced air mobility companies be doing now in this process? They're, they're finishing certifications and they're seeking insurance for customers. We're going to actually bring on some people to talk uh, customers to talk about that as part of this series we're doing here. So from your perspective, what, what do you think that should be? When you bring a team together as the CEO of a uh, advanced air mobility EV toll OEM, and you go and raise hundreds of millions of dollars and you go to Silicon Valley and you hire the world's best talent and you write your to-do list of what you need to accomplish as a company at the time scale. Buy insurance is very low on that yes. list. <laughs> it's, it's not something that people get excited about, generally speaking. And then most people, their experience with insurance personally isn't always that as people have had unpleasant experiences with insurance. And often you don't get to deal with a human being. You don't get a full relationship with someone by house insurance, by car insurance. It doubles some year. There's nobody you can talk to about it. You can't go and have a coffee with someone to discuss it. It's frustrating. You know? Aviation insurance is just totally different. There's a person at the end of the computer. They will fly across the world to see you. They will engage with you. You say, hey, we want to do a market visit to our EV toll um, manufacturing site. Come and meet the engineers. The market will accommodate that. They'll come and meet you and they'll, they'll get to know your technology and your aircraft. That's going to make a big difference when it comes to finding available capacity for aircraft. If the underwriters are sitting there and they're looking at the risk information that the brokers sent through, and the thing, I've, I've met the engineers at this company. I've seen the battery ma manufacturing process. I've seen the final assembly line. I trust them. That's going to make a big difference. And then the other thing I mentioned is the Friday afternoon problem, which I'm sure you're very aware of. Where somebody rings up and says, oh, I need my need insurance. Yeah. Uh, I'm picking this up tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's Saturday. I'm picking it up. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. Well, yeah. We're on the runway. Yeah, exactly. We'll just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So that's the Friday afternoon problem. There's a chance that a whole industry could do that, that the advanced air mobility industry can get to commercialization and just about to scale. And suddenly we think, oh, dear, there's not available insurance capacity and the available expertise to offer capacity at an affordable level because if if the cost of insurance makes the makes the business models less profitable that could be really damaging for the industry and nobody wants that that's not what we want as aviation underwriters we like aviation we want these companies to do well we want to support them. yeah and i know you've you know personally visited you know several of them already as we talked about and and you know like like I said, just from the start, we could we could go on for some time about just all the innovations, all the, the processes, but even the training programs are very impressive. And and we're kind of at the uh, end of the time that I would typically want to go with. But, uh, you know, just speak to that real quick, because that's always a big thing on the mind of, of aviation insurers is training. So can you just, just touch on that subject from your perspective and what you've learned? There's been some fascinating research that has suggested that with... Um, a unified flight control, if, you, if you're not a pilot, you are much quicker to become familiar with flying an eVTOL than if you're a pilot. The pilots have to unlearn a lot. However, the regulators are going to start by requiring commercial pilots to come and be trained on eVTOLs. So the initial group of pilots, cohort of pilots for eVTOLs are going to be, are going to be aviators, which I think is a good thing. We want people to understand how airspace works, how to fly in an aviation ecosystem. 
that's a good thing. Um, Holocopter in Europe recently got their permission from um, EASA as a as a training center. So they, as the OEM, will be training the pilots. That's a good thing from the insurance point of view. These oh, yeah. people really understand it. I know CAE here is doing a lot of work in this space to to support your detail companies with training. You're not going to have dual, dual controls. Um, the, the SVAR, Special Federation um, Aviation Regulations, last year, yeah, people are thinking, what are you, we're, we're, there's no way we can have dual flight controls in EVTOL. I have to build a completely different aircraft to do that. You know? So to the extent that you could have your them, the, the instructor on the ground overseeing the flight and you could have a solo flight, that's yet to be seen, I think. I haven't, I haven't got a huge amount of insight into exactly how that's going to work. But it will work. They'll find a way to make it work. Yeah, it's really interesting. And we're going to uh, hopefully be visiting with um, one of the early uh, purchasers of, of, uh, of an EV tall aircraft who has been going through, and, and I know you saw him there uh, just this last week, uh, through a training process. And, and he's going to speak to that from his perspective. And, and what I've heard, it's, it's very, very interesting. And I think that it's something that it'll be good for aviation insurers to hear for sure. And uh, again, all these segments, it's, it's just exciting to hear how these new emerging companies are addressing the concerns that I know our insurance market would have uh, in advance of even bringing you know, it to market. So yes, they probably are waiting longer than they should, but the good news is, is what they have is, is, is already pretty impressive. So that's exciting. And that in mind, uh, we are kind of getting to the end of uh, the attention span of, that I have. And uh, again, uh, if you and I were just sitting here, uh, we'd probably go on for another few hours as, as we have in the past. So I guess I would just say, you know, we've, we've kind of just tried to give the, the surface level or, or, you know, high altitude, I should say, view of, of what's coming and what, what you're learning. And it's, it's all very exciting. I think that as an industry, as an aviation industry, as an aviation insurance industry, we have to be, you know, asking how can we be a part of this in order to improve safety, in order to, um, you know, uh, you know, be a part of what's going on in the future, and not get you know left behind, um, in terms of you know, addressing all of the, these issues. How can we be integrating these battery systems, these these redundancies, these controls that improve safety, uh, improve the uh, transportation experiences, and, and and changes the way uh, we live? You know, rural. I think rural. There's applications that we'll we'll see and. Obviously, at cities, as, as the AI-generated, uh, you know, uh, images have, have proclaimed, it's certainly, you know, uh, as a society. So that in mind, we've covered a, a lot of high-level things. Any closing thoughts or anything you think we might have missed uh, from a key level during this discussion? My closing message to all the listeners would be, if you've got any insight or thoughts on anything we've mentioned, I'd love to hear from you and ask to talk to you. No, it's, it's a learning process. And, you know, I think that's just to echo what I said from the get go, it's, you know, it takes innovators and, you know, it's always interesting. It seems like, you know, that London market's typically involved in a lot of the innovation in the aviation insurance space, even though it's operations, it could not be business behind, they're always on the forefront of creating solutions, innovating, you know, different ways to underwrite, create capacity. And so even what we're doing in the US, we end up, you know, partnering with that domestic market uh, in order to get that done. So it's exciting to hear from you. All that effort, I can imagine that your frequent flyer miles have uh, have reached uh, peak status on at least multiple airlines and and your hotel points are uh, are getting to a pretty attractive level. Uh, so, uh, but stay tuned guys. This is, uh, you know, this is an exciting topic. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, it's coming. Uh, some of you are, are just pumped and excited about it. Some of you are skeptical. Some of you are just, as, as we talked about earlier, trying to identify what AAM and EVTOL is. And so wherever you're at, uh, it's coming. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and if you want to be involved in uh, growing in the aviation market, the aviation insurance market, it's something that you should be learning about now and learning uh, the things that Alistair has been uh, learning and, and beyond so we can innovate and provide the products and solutions this industry that is coming will need. And with that, I just want to thank you again. Uh, I'm sure that we'll have follow-up discussions, but we want to just kind of introduce people to the exciting things that are, are going on. So thank you for your time today. We look forward to uh, uh, those of us that are here at the conference hearing the uh, panel tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's all for this episode. Join us again next time as we continue navigating the waypoints in aviation insurance. Until then, enjoy clear skies and unlimited 
disability. Thanks for listening to the Aviation Insurance Podcast. If you found this episode of value, please share it with someone who would benefit from this information. Don't forget to subscribe in your podcast player so you don't miss any new episodes and to help our show have more impact. This episode is brought to you by Eris Insurance Solutions, your flight plan for navigating the turbulence of aviation insurance. For more information, visit erisinsurance.com. That is www.aerisinsurance.com. Disclaimer. These episodes are for educational purposes only, and due to the changing regulatory and legal nature of the business, some information may change over time. Having a well-educated and experienced aviation insurance broker on your team is an absolute requirement to success in business and for managing your aircraft and aviation business risks.